everybody, I'm Nick and welcome to another episode of Code Cop. This is where we go over bad advice given in places like LinkedIn, Twitter or posts and we try to turn it into good advice and learn from it. Now, in this video, I have a very particularly interesting post because it is about validation and especially in .NET, validation is a thing that many people do differently and there's not a standardized way of doing it. Uh, we sort of have agreed that fluent validation is a nice NuGet package to do validation. But when you try to write validation code yourself, it's very much loose and open to interpretation. So in this video, I'm going to show you this bad advice, which I think shows two bad practices. And then I'm going to show you how I would do it. And no, we're not going to use fluent validation. This is a different way to approach this. And if you haven't seen any programming language outside C Sharp, I don't think you've seen this solution ever. So let's take a look at what we have. The advice in question is the following. We have a good code and bad code. So you have the bad code over here where we have a user object coming into a validate method. And then we have null checks on the name and empty string. And if that's the case, we say name cannot be empty in the console and we return. Then we have the same for the age. It has to be within the boundaries. And then the same on the email. We have a null check and then it contains or it should contain an add symbol. If all of those succeed, then you return true. So the validate method is returning a boolean. However, you're writing into the console, which by the way, you never do unless you're making a console application. So this example is fundamentally flawed, not because of the code, which, you know, the checks kind of suck anyway, like you shouldn't be checking for email like this, you shouldn't be checking about names like this. This looks like it was intentionally written to be fixed with the fix that we have over here, which is also pretty bad because what this user is saying we should do is return an enumerable of strings, which as we're going to see, it's going to contain the errors as a string value. And then we pass the same user back in and then we allocate a new list per time we call this method. We add those methods. We don't return. We don't exit early. Instead, we go through all the validation. We add any errors in here. And then in the end, we return the errors, which besides what I'm going to show you is very bizarre because, well, this doesn't really fix the check of the email, but we're just going to go with it. We don't really care about that too much. This all could be better. But what I find bizarre is the user chose to create a list and then say errors dot add and then return the list instead of doing a yield return. Since you're returning an enumerable anyway, it might have to do with the way this is computed. And if that's the case, then I get it. But the idea is that if this I enumerable, if this list is empty when you return it back, then validation passed. Otherwise, you have errors to work with. However, this is a very frustrating way to do validation because you have to know that empty means good and not empty means I have an error which can be fine, but it's also not very obvious when you're, let's say you're consuming this type of code through a library and that's written by someone else and you have to look into the method to understand what exactly is this supposed to return. And there's some uh, text associated with this post. I always want to add as much uh, context as possible. And the idea is that when it comes to writing good and bad code in .NET, especially regarding validation, it's important to adhere to best practices to enhance maintenance, reliability and performance of your code. I don't think that none of that can be justified here. Like allocating a list every time you want to validate your, your class or your object is not performant at all. In fact, this will be significantly more performant if you see it in isolation. And there's two camps in doing validation, the fail fast approach and the go through every validation approach. Both have pros and cons. I generally tend to prefer the fail fast approach because if some of those checks have to call databases or have to make other API requests, well, you put the low hanging fruit on top and you let the user fix those first. And then you only validate for the expensive validations later down the code and you short circuiting the method and ending up having it more performant. And the fact that we're returning a true or false is also better as well. Now, I want to point out that I don't like validation that is true or false. And I'm going to show you what I like, but I want you to understand that these are both, in my opinion, very, very bad. And again, that's besides fluent validation and NuGet packages specializing in validation. Same for attributes. We're not looking into that now. We want to talk about the code itself. And because this is LinkedIn, the reactions keep going. Yes, this is amazing. That's how you should do validation. Hell yeah. 
and it doesn't stop there. You can have people be like, well, how about this? How about you ref an enumerable string of errors because of XAML? And then instead of ref, I would use out. Like the bad advice keeps coming left, right, and center, and just hits me like this, and I have to pause and think, like, what is happening here? And again, as always, all of these are anonymized because this is not about the people. This is about the advice. But Jesus Christ. Now, what I did is I went to my ID and I added the code in both scenarios. So we have the, the bad validation method, as you can see over here. And then we have the good validation method, which I label as also bad. And what I want to do is I want to show you how I would do it with a bit of a different approach, a bit of a spin. Uh, first and foremost, nothing in here needs to be instantiatable. Like this is a pure function. It doesn't affect the input in any way. It is just running some method, some numbers, and then returning an outcome. So this method, and in fact, the class in this current form could also be static. So public static void validate. This is not going to stay as void. I'm going to show you um, what I'm going to do with this. But let's just assume that the code in the validation itself is fine, even though I don't think it is. We're going to change it just a little bit. Let's assume that I'm a user and I want to know what's happening with validation and I want to act on meaningful validation messages. So I need some context. I need to know what happened. Uh, now, like I said, a tuple could in theory work, which is is valid, right? So you have the is valid and then you have, uh, let's say, an I enumerable of strings, which is the errors. And this could be null, for example. So this is a nullable line numerable. So if everything is good, we return is valid and null. Otherwise, we return the message. If I just quickly copy everything here as just the way it was before, um, I could have something like this. I could say that uh, return errors dot count more than zero. So if we have any, then let's return true. So it is valid and then null here. Otherwise, false, actually, otherwise needs to be like this, otherwise, false, and then return the errors. No, this is count equals zero. So if there's no errors, then it is true. And if I do that and I add a breakpoint, then as we're going to see, you know, because the email is null, I'm going to get result is false. And then I'm going to have email is not valid as the error message. If more things were invalid, let's say the, the name was null or empty, and I did that, then as you might expect, this is still false, but I also now have two errors, so I have more context. Now, this is not the way I like to do things, but I think it's better than both approaches, because in this scenario, I can define the type explicitly, and I know exactly what's what, right? I know that the validation has a parameter called is valid. Is it valid? If yes, do something with it, otherwise get an error. Or this validate method could return a validation result, well, class, which by the way already exists in .NET. And if the result is successful, if I, in fact, if we just add this and we go here, we should be able to see if it is success, return the success, otherwise the error message and we can actually go quickly and implement it here. So we can say new validation result. So if it has an error, then we're going to say errors. In fact, because of the way this is structured, I can say join maybe with a comma and a space, and then I can pass down the error so I can do something like this. Uh, but this is only if I have more than uh, one error. So I can say that if errors.count is zero, then I'm going to return a success. Otherwise, I'm going to return the error. So I have something like this. So I have validation result dot success. Otherwise, I'm going to join the result. So if I do that, then I have a different uh, sort of approach here. I have the result object, which will give me the error messages if there are any. So I can say error message and I can also get the member names. If I run that, then I'm going to get a, a join uh, response or I can separate them as individual values as well. Uh, or I can say that if result equals validation result success. So if it is success, then console.write line, this was valid. And I can say something like this. So I'm going to pass the bad error here, or well, or errors are bad. So I'm going to say Nick, and then I'm going to say Nick at dome train. 
Dot.com. By the way, on Dome Train, we just launched a free seven day trial. So you can check it out in the description down below. You get access to 10 courses for free for 10 days. It's the easiest way to get started with Dome Train. So now that I have that, if I just run it, you're going to see that this was valid because it matches the success static object. But if something was invalid, like this was an empty string, then as you might expect, the email is not valid. But even then, this is not my favorite approach to solving this because I'm more of a functional programming guy. So what I've done already is I've added the language extensions NuGet package. And I want to show you how I would handle this, especially if it was supposed to be mapped into, let's say, an API response. So what I would do instead of all this fluff and all these lists and all this everything is I would change this to be a validation type that can return an error or it can return, in this case, a Boolean, or maybe just the user that was supposed to be validated. Now, this validation is a monad, is sort of the either monad, so it can either be an error or something else to represent success. In this case, it is the user. And once I do that, I can have an error, which contains anything error-related, like the error message. And I can also short-circuit it early to get a performance benefit, in my case, because that's how I like to do validation. But if you want to at the end, you can still do that. And because this is a discriminated union, basically, it's a, the either monad, all I want to say here is return error dot new, and this will be automatically now mapped to that validation struct. And I can do the same for all the others. So I'm going to say return age must be between 18 and 20, and I'm going to do the same here. And as you can see, this is pretty, pretty neat, and it looks pretty clean if you ask me. And in the end, if this is all good, I'm just going to return the user. And now, you know exactly what you're going to consume if you've done any uh, functional programming before. You immediately know how to handle this. But let's say I have the result, the validation result. So I have user validation dot validate the user. And now, because this is the validation uh, type, the validation nomad, all I have to say is, hey, is this a failure? Is this success? Depends on how you want to handle it. Or if this is an API and ultimately what I want to return is an I result, which can be a straight API result, which can be returned straight into the API and converted into an HTTP response. All I have to do is say result dot match or match async if you have an async uh, function in there. And what I'm going to say is results dot OK here. So if it is a success, just take that error and return it into a K, or maybe you want to turn it into created or whatever response you want. Otherwise, you want to take that uh, failure and you want to say results dot, you can say bad request or you can say problem details or whatever. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to take the head, which is the error and just print it. So if I did that, what I'm going to get in the end, as you're going to see here with this bad request, because the email is null, as you're going to see, I'm going to get a bad request of type error, and the value is email is not valid. So I'm getting that message in the response. If I was to print this, it serialize it into JSON and return it, that's exactly what I'd get. Now, I don't have an HTTP context for this to, to run and for you to see it, but if this was, for example, the correct email address countering the bad request, then as you're going to see, this will now be an OK containing the value of the user. So that way, not only do you have a very neat way to write your validation, and of course, this could be implemented even further with uh, changing this to an is less than 18 or more than 120, which, by the way, I prefer writing in reverse, because if your error is age must be between 18 and 120, then why don't you reverse it to keep it within the bounds? But OK, I digress. And my matching in the end leads to way better and more predictable code, in my opinion. Very, very neat. Obviously, I'm new lining here and I have an inflated font for my ID so you can see. But in reality, this is just a single line of code and you just say return this and you're done. I think this is pretty cool, pretty neat. There's many areas where you can take uh, language extensions. If you want to see more functional programming, leave a comment down below and let me know and I'll make a video like this. But now I wonder from you, what do you think about this? And what's your favorite way of validating outside of data annotation attributes and full validation? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.